Nice Soul Kaiser man uh, who came to the Scalable last fall and suggested bringing this event to the community. <coughs> I know that him and myself and the entire staff is very excited for the turnout and the build-up for this event. And like you, I'm very excited uh, to be a part of it. I will not be my club if I will not tell you about a few events who are coming up. So I, will, I ask that on the way out you will take a catalog. Uh, on the way in, you also receive the postcard for morning our class, which is a play reading. We are holding here uh, on April 13. Uh, it is a polished play uh, about a classroom of students, both Jewish and non-Jews, and what happened to them after the war. Uh, and it, is, it is important play. It is being premiered here in New York with a major cast. Uh, so check out the postcard. The only thing I need to announce is that Kim Cottrell uh, is not going to be a part of it, but she is being replaced by Catherine Turner. Uh, yeah, very exciting. So please join us. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, the uh, Saul Kaiserman who will introduce the event. In the past eight years, Saul has served as the director of the lifelong learning here at the Temple. Uh, he is now also a student uh, getting his PhD. Uh, very supportive colleague. Uh, very excited for you, Saul. Uh, so Saul Kaiserman, please come up. He's well the way by Mark Kaiserman. I uh, went to school at JTS, and is yes, HUC, HUC, I mean, HUC. Thanks for paying attention. Um, and it's now in Kennedy is the rabbi in the Reform Temple of Forest Hills in Queens. Please help me welcome Saul and Mark. Thank you for coming. This is my brother, Mark Kaiserman. We want, we want to just say thanks to all of you for being here, really, really uh, especially to friends of our parents and family and our friends and interested people that you've joined us here today. We're, we're so touched and delighted that you came to join us for this, really, this book release party for our, our Zadie Menashe's book. So we're going to tell you a little bit about the family history and tell you a little of the story of our grandfather, our Zadie, and then uh, Jonathan is going to come up, tell you a little bit about the context of the book, the, who the Kotzker Rebbe was, a little bit more about him, and then he's going to read some really, I think, delightful sections of the translation, and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, so, you want to say anything else? No. Great. Okay, so. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this was already back in 2008. I got out of the blue an email uh, from someone who like saw on Wikipedia that I was the grandson of Menashe Unger saying, hey, you know, I've got this book in Yiddish, Pshishkin and Kutsk. Uh, I, I think it would be interesting to translate it. Can, can, can I get permission to do it? I was like, gee, well, let me ask my mom what she thinks. You know, my mom was like, yeah, sure, just make sure you give some of the money to Evo. And he's like, well, how about Yiddish Book Center? And you're like, okay. So there it is. Now, all of a sudden, last year, I get an email from Jonathan. I'd completely forgotten about this. I get an email from Jonathan. The book is translated. We're ready. How do you feel about having a book release party together? This is very exciting. You've seen copies of the translation outside. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about our, our grandfather and our family and, and how they got to uh, be here. So Menashe Unger was born on the 27th of Cheshvan in 5659, or the 12th of November, 1899, in the of Jatna in Western Galicia. Uh, which is sometimes part of Austria and is now part of Poland. In the 18th and 19th century, Jabno was an impoverished town. Half of the citizens of the town were Jewish. The economy started to improve in the 20th century as the railroad arrived. Now, this here is a copy of a family tree that my mom put together. We're not sure whether it was for like, her Yiddish school or for her regular school, but you know, here, that's her on the bottom, Judy, and Menashe and Ruth, and all the way up. So, um, she, Menashe was a descendant of my like, great Hasidic lineage. Um, my mom said that when he was putting it together, this tree for us, he's going through it, he knew the names 
of every one of the rabbis he was descended from, and then he kind of feels like he was kind of making up the names of the wives as he went along. He was like, that's a Hada, that's a Lupa. <laughs> so I don't know how accurate this tree really is, but it's interesting because he did all the names are really like Lazarus and Moses. He didn't like uh, uh, English rather than like writing you know, like you know, laser or something like that. What I didn't know in rabbinical school, and wish I did, was that I'm related to so many great families of, of, of the Hasidic world. I, I don't know how much uh, credit it would have gotten me, but some of the professors probably would have uh, favored me there. Uh, the, we include relatives from Elie Bama from the Sense, the Seer of Lublin, and the Magid of Kazanitz. So uh, one of the, the top of the family tree is Reb Naftali of Rabschitz. And now, something about Rebbe Naftali he has this famous tradition that we learned about, I read about when I was, um, before I had any idea that I was related to him, that uh, on Passover, he, uh, for the cup of Elijah, uh, the Kos Eliyahu, instead of having it sitting on the table full, start with it empty, and everybody takes a little bit of their own glass of wine and pour it into the cup for Elijah, and that's a way of kind of symbolizing that we all have to work together to bring about the, you know, the messianic time, the time of redemption. And so I read about this in Martin Buber's Tales of the Hasidim, thought it was a really cool custom, and we started doing it in our family's Passover Seder, and then only years later did I discover that we were related to Reb Naftali of Rapshit. So in other words, this family tradition that had been done back in Eastern Europe that we would completely forgotten about, we took back on by way of Martin Boomer. <laughs> Our great-grandfather, Menashe's father, was the Javner Rebbe, the renowned rabbi of the town of, of the town. He was Rabbi Shalom, uh, uh, his name was Rabbi Shalom David Unger, and, and Saul is named for him, uh, both in English and in Hebrew. Um, and uh, uh, Menashe's mother was Bluma Hannah Horowitz, and we don't have any pictures of her. Uh, our mom always said she was much more tr the traditional of the two, uh, which is not so uncommon among a, a rabbi and his wife. And uh, uh, when our grandfather eventually left the Hasidic world, he stayed in touch with his father, but he and his mother never spoke again. Um, Shalom David had uh, many Hasidic followers who was known to be a brilliant man, very well educated and intellectual. He was the eldest of four, um, and all of them were brothers. There was, uh, his brothers were Yehuda of Sokolov, Chaim Eliezer of Rodlov, and Yisrael Yosef of the Javna Dunans. Um, and he died in uh, 1923. Shalom David. Um, and <clears throat> Shalom David was actually the author of a book of um, Shalos and Suvos, Questions and Answers. Um, he was particularly, this is a book of responsive, people would like ask questions that he would answer. And <clears throat> he was particularly known for writing about what were called grass widows, people, women whose husbands had maybe gone off to war and then never returned. And so their status was, was uncertain as a wife. Like, could they remarry? with a husband who's presumed dead, and a big piece of what he worked to do in his writing was to try and release them from these obligations so that they could remarry and, and go on with their lives. Um, and he also wrote down the first half of his grandfather's book, so that's our great-great-great-great-grandfather's book, uh, which is called Imre Noam, uh, also a book of uh, Shemus and Chubos, uh, Questions and Answers from the Scholars and the Rabbis. Menashe, according to our mom, didn't talk much about his own childhood, his own family. So we kind of pieced some things together much, much later, some things that our mom didn't even really know about. Um, uh, Menashe was the oldest of five. The young, excuse me, Menashe was the youngest of five. The oldest was Rabbi Eliezer of Lazar, who's uh, on the left in this picture, on her left. Um, and he became the Jacques No Rebbe after Shalom Doug, being the oldest son. Uh, he's pictured here with Yisrael Spiro, the Blushiver Rebbe, who was married to Menashe's older sister, Pearl, or Pearl. Um, Eliezer, the brother, lived in Tarno through the first part of the Second World War until June of 1942, when he, along with all 30,000 Jews in Tarno, were taken by trucks to concentration camps and executed. 
Now, um, Menashe's sister Pearl, who was married to the blush of a rabbi, died in uh, 19, um, uh, was among the ones who died in, in the Holocaust and the Shoah. But um, the blush of her, uh, her husband, didn't die until 1989. At the time, he was the oldest living Hasidic Rebbe in the world, and his family still lives in Brooklyn, where his son was now the head of the Hasidic dynasty. Um, and, and they're still very, they're not, we're not very much a part of their lives, um, but I didn't get to do a wedding uh, last spring. Um, uh, Eliezer's daughters, Gitel and Malka, this is Gitel, also survived the Holocaust. Malka moved to British Mandate Palestine before World War II, and Gitel, really we knew growing up, and um, who my daughter, uh, uh, Ziva Gitel, is named for, lived in, 19, uh, in Borough Park uh, until 1994, very close to the family of the Blush of Arabi, and um, she was kind of a, a, a particular, I, mean, I don't know how typical this was, but she would come to things like our bar mitzvah services, where she would have to bring her own food, you know, she stayed with us, like, it's, it's kind of unusual even for today for people who, can, like, really, who are really in the Hasidic world uh, from that background to even step foot in a reform temple. Um, but that was something that she did for family. As we know, for, for someone who was part of another Jewish world from us, she couldn't have been more supportive and open of, of the two of us, and those she didn't live to see us go on to be Jewish professionals, we know she would have been the, the proudest of, of anyone in okay. our family. Um, this is his middle, his middle brother, Israel, uh, who died on a trip to New York in 1933, but we actually don't know what the story behind that is. We just know that that's when he passed away. And the other sibling was uh, his sister, Manuka, um, with whom he was very close. And we don't know very much about her, but there seems to be a, an incredibly sad backstory to it. We know that his friend, the writer Yehudi Yari, wrote about her. Manuka passed out of this world so tragically young. We could tell many stories about her. I'm sure that if Menashe had written the novel he dreamed about writing in his youth, Manuka would have been his main, its main heroine. But the story is so deeply painful that I would not be able to encompass it in a few lines. So it's better to be silent. And so our, our mom's middle name is Minucha um, after her. Um, now we do not know much about um, our Zadie's childhood in, in Chapno. Here he's pictured with his father's Gabai, um, the Reb Isaac Einhorn, in around 1909. And like his brothers, he grew up being trained to be a rabbi. Um, we, my mom, there was one story he told that he was raising a pet duck um, and when he was living as a little kid in, in the shtetl. And um, one time the duck kind of waddled in in time for dinner, and after that he never ate duck again for the rest of his life. Um, and another story, uh, apparent that my mom told us only recently, so apparently um, in this time uh, in the Hasidic world, brides were not allowed to sleep in, right next to their husbands for the first seven days after getting married during the Sheva Brachas. And so um, he would have to sleep in between his <laughs> sisters and their husbands uh, when, when they got married for the seven days, and apparently he, he really hated that. <laughs> uh, so uh, you can see their job now over there, just north of Tarno. And during the First World War, when the Russian army started to come into Galicia, the rabbis of many of the shtetls and many of their Hasidim fled from the Russians. And um, so along with many of the rabbis, the Javner moved to Tarno, which was a much bigger city, about a four-hour walk, so not that far away. That's Google Maps. <laughs> um, his friend Yehudi Yari tells this story. I met Menashe Unger for the first time a few weeks after the outbreak of World War I. I just had my bar mitzvah, and Menashe was one year older. I was from a small shtetl in the Vistula region named the Shtetl Zhikke, where Menashe's grandfathers ruled in their rabbinic kingdoms. We small children fled to Tarno, and soon the shtetl and the whole area were occupied by the Russian army. The Javna Rebbe and his family also went to Tarno. They thought that Tarno was a big city many miles from the front, and until the Russian Cossacks got there, the war would be over. I remember the first Sabbath in Tarno, I didn't know what to do with myself, so I walked back and forth on the street where I heard public singing in a house. And so I went in. And there was the Javna Rebbe, who was holding his first tish, his first uh, gathering 
uh, as a refugee rabbi, and there weren't a lot of people there because of the war. So I easily approached the table, and there behind the rabbi stood a young boy in a black round velvet hat. Under the hat emerged two long curly pinks. He was dressed in black silk long jacket. His face was spiritual, like we see in paintings of the great masters of the Renaissance. He stood and he sang, and his voice rose above the whole assembly. Right after the tish, we met. I'm sure that he was the one who approached me. I was full of esteem for the rabbi's son, so I would surely not have dared approach him. He must have seen a refugee child in me, not a local one. A child who came to the rabbi without his father. He wanted to encourage me, and perhaps because he knew that he was also a refugee child, he thought we could be good friends. And it turned out they were lifelong friends. As the First World War progressed and the front lines moved to Tarno, many Hasidic families moved from Tarno to Vienna. Uh, here, Menashe entered the Brody Yeshiva, studying with the brilliant rabbi Meir Arak. He received his Sneka, his rabbinic ordination, at age 18 in 1917. And then 80 years later, with the same name, I received mine, my rabbinic Sneka as well. I, I can't really explain why Google Maps didn't put the word Vienna there, but that B is Vienna. And in Vienna, the Nashi's world now had two sides to it. Um, at home, he was part of a rabbinic household, uh, which still kept the classic Hasidic customs. Um, and uh, all the mitzvot, major, minor, not just the older generations, the parents and grandparents, but also the young people, his age and his peers, teenagers, were also you know, devout all, all, all the time at home. But in Vienna, there was theater, the opera house, art palaces. It was a city of music and literature. So according to our mother, he used to sneak off together with um, his brother-in-law, Shulcha, the village of Rebbe that we saw before. Um, and they would go to the circus together. And, um, you know, she doesn't know if uh, they changed out of their clothes or what they did with their bayas to tuck it behind, but um, they had another life that wasn't uh, the Hasidic home life that they, that they well, in Utah. Well, I also remember as a kid, my mom telling us that uh, Menashe would still go see uh, uh, the Blizzard of Rebbe, the great Blizzard of Rebbe, and they would go off into the Mikva and watch TV. Uh, it was the only place they couldn't be bothered. Uh, well, they were growing up in New York City. Um, but as, as a young man, Yudhiyama said that, the, who now has also moved to Vienna, uh, said that they would uh, stroll in the new garden and together they would sing an aria from Carmen or a motif from Beethoven at the, with the same excitement that they sang the Hasidic melodies. Uh, they would quote poems by Rilke, scenes from Ibsen, and um, even make jokes about the Hasidic rabbis. But when they returned home, they were their traditional Orthodox selves, uh, uh, chanting the traditional melodies handed down from their grandfather, Rabbi Mordecai David of Debrava, Melodies of the Soul's Journey. So um, the, the music that you heard on the way and that we'll play again uh, later on are reel-to-reel -reel tapes that we had in, in, uh, from my grandfather um, that we, we actually only turned into uh, recordings that we could listen to about two weeks ago. And we'll, we'll tell you more about them, but those are those Hasidic melodies. Well, um, so soon after the war, uh, Menashe's friends from the non-rabbinic world by and large, they went to Mandate Palestine and became Khalidzim, but he got married off to a Hasidic girl um, in Krakow, whose name was Chaya Frankel Teromim. Um, we think that probably it was an arranged marriage, and she was a distant cousin. I couldn't find the exact genealogy, but I'm pretty confident she was a cousin. And later on, Jonathan's going to be reading a chapter of the, the book, Fire and Cups, that describes a Hasidic wedding. And we actually think that it was probably modeled very much on his own wedding um, to Chaya. Um, but Menashe never talked about this marriage, and actually our family was completely unaware that he had been married before being married to our grandmother um, until last spring when I went to that wedding that I described to you before. So my mom described learning this just as mind-blowing, that he had been married before, um, and, and frankly the marriage did not last long, we don't know why. Interestingly, after she was divorced, Chaya married um, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lau, 
And although she and her husband were both murdered during the Holocaust, their sons Yisrael and Naftali survived the war, emigrated to Palestine in 1945, 